morning, guys. Good morning. See, Dave's right. The 11 o'clock service is better. This is cool. Uh, I swear everybody was asleep through the first service. So uh, thanks for that. That's awesome. Uh, as Dave said, my name is Micah Holt. Uh, you may or may not have seen me around. Um, I play the drums about once a month up here. Uh, my wife, Elizabeth, uh, has been running uh, Operation Christmas Child the last couple of years. And we have an incredibly cute three-year-old daughter, three-year-old next week, oh my Lord, um, that you've probably seen around doing cute things. Also, if you're, uh, if you're a parent of a teenager, you may have known me as one of the youth leaders upstairs on Wednesday nights. Uh, so you may have heard me around. If we haven't met yet, well, there's still time. Um, so I am here today to talk to you guys about something that's really been on my heart and mind for the last several months. Um, and it's this one simple statement. Anyone can be used by God, no matter your past. That's a no-brainer, right? For us Christians, we, we, we are taught from, from early on that God forgives us of our sins and that he has a plan for us. So if you follow that logic out, it's very simple to know that, that God can use us no matter what we've done. But does anybody struggle with that? I know I do. My struggle really began toward the end of 2019. You see, I've been used by God and comfortable with that for a long time, mostly playing the drums. I've been playing drums now for about 30 years, and my mama always told me, that it was a gift that God gave me. Because I've never had a lesson. I'm not saying I'm great, but I'm sufficient. And, and my mama said that that was God's gift to me and I should give it back to him. And so I did that. And I was always okay with it because it was, it was kind of easy. And I felt comfortable doing that. And I was okay with telling my Christian friends that, you know, things that I learned in my Bible study or things that I learned in church. And once in a while, if everything lined up just right and everything was okay. I could talk to one of my atheist friends or maybe a stranger about God, but not a lot. Just a little God nugget, as I call it. And just, just enough to, to let them know something about God. But this was different. See, in 2019, I started feeling God leading me toward ministry and teaching and preaching. Now, my first reaction to that was something like, <laughs> no, 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 no. See, no, that's, no, God, mm -mm. I know you're smart, but no. Um, and the thing is, he started talking more and more about it. He started pushing me more and more, and then my reaction was, uh oh, because I thought maybe one day, one day I'll be in front of people like I am now. And what if they know what I did? What if they know my past? Well, heads up, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Because I can't be afraid of it. I can't be afraid of you knowing about my past if I tell you about it, right? And maybe, maybe you'll be able to identify a little bit. So, I don't have time to go into the big long story, so I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. I was born to two Christian parents. They were good people. They had varying views from each other and varying views from myself, but they tried. They have always tried to love God. They were in a southern gospel group for many years as I was growing up, and so we traveled around uh, central and southern Indiana and eastern Kentucky trying to see different churches, you know, with, with that group, and my parents also had a problem. I don't want to say problem. They had, they had, seemed to have a hard time being knowing where they should be with God and with churches. And so we went to a lot of different churches for that too. And so it wasn't really until I was about sixth grade that I kind of started having a home church. And I really enjoyed it though. We went every Sunday and I started playing the drums there. And I looked forward to being in the youth group. But when I was a freshman, just three years later, a church kind of broke up unceremoniously. We came in one Sunday and they said, okay, that was fun, see ya. So 
I quickly got into another church because I was, I was ready. I wanted to be a part of God. So I found a church, and the biggest church in our hometown, actually. And we had over 1,000 people on a Sunday morning. In our youth group, we had over 250, sometimes over 300 students every single Wednesday night. And with a youth group that big, we had our own band. And it was, you know, not, not just a, a piano and, and a guitar and some goofy guy singing, but it was like a full band like we got here. And then we had our own drama team. We had uh, greeters and ushers, altar workers, butlers, maids, cooks, cleaners. It was awesome. Everything you could want, we had. And I became involved in all of it. And not only involved, but I also kind of became a leader in most of those things. And I really thought I knew what it was to serve God, but I, I obviously didn't at that point. I come to find out. As it is for much, uh, many people, high school was very tumultuous for me. Just a year later as a sophomore, I met a girl. And this girl was like one to two social classes above me. She was, uh, she was really cool, kind of you know, popular, and I was what you call a nerd. Uh, much like this, only about 70 pounds lighter. Uh, my sophomore year, I was five foot four and like 115 pounds, and I, I promise you, I'm not now. Um, but, but what happened, by dating this girl, I got some popularity. The guys on the wrestling team and the basketball teams, they started saying, hey, nice, good job. And I started standing a little bit higher. I was five foot four and a half. Yeah, it was awesome. Didn't gain any weight, though, so I became skinnier. Um, but I liked that. I really craved that attention. And it was something I really enjoyed. As time went on, a year later, my parents decided it was time for them to move to Florida. And I know what you're thinking. Florida. Two years in the sun, on the beach. Anybody ever been to, like, actual Florida? It is about as redneck as you get. Like, it is horrible. Which, I, no offense to anybody who loves that state, but honestly, there's nothing there except for, like, Universal Studios that really draws me. I love that place. Okay, yeah, you were right over there, the Gulf Coast. But that's not where they were going. So I put up a big fight, and I didn't want to go. And I fought for like a month, and I actually won that fight against my parents. And I stayed in our home in central Indiana where, where I had grown up by myself, 16 years old. I was on my own. I went and got a job. I uh, put food in the house. Started paying some of the bills. My parents paid for the most of the stuff, but as time went on and they made less and I made a little bit more and I was there to pay the water bill and they weren't, it just kind of happened. And I, I felt good because I was an adult, so I thought. And I still stayed up with church, kept my girlfriend going. I, um, you know, I, I still was a pretty good student, but I started slipping into things that doing some things behind closed doors that our parents and our pastors wouldn't want to know about, or at least that we didn't want them to know about. And I went further and further away from God. My senior year, it kind of all fell apart. It's when it really hit rock bottom. We broke up, as those relationships tend to do, and I realized at that point that I had completely turned my back on everything except this girl. And when I didn't have her anymore, I didn't have anything. And now I didn't have her. Um, it, made me, it made me mad. I got really upset with God. started thinking that God had left me, that I had given up my family and my friends and my church, and now he had taken that away from me too. Where, why would God do that? I started looking into other denominations and then further into other religions found a lot of peace in Buddhism and kind of really thought maybe this was the way to go. Started seeking out new friends, more girls. Found a lot of parties, a lot of alcohol, and even started getting into drugs. But all into that, I was actually kind of blessed, if you can believe that. You see, that time of my life only lasted about two years. And by the time I was 19, I'd met a girl, I'd settled down a little bit, 
and really thought I was falling in love. By the time I was 22, we were married. We were married, and we thought we were in love, and we were doing great, and we had been hurt by church, so we didn't want to do the church thing, but we loved God, and we tried to do God on our own. Anybody know how well that works? Doesn't. That's right. And it didn't. And we, we didn't do real well. I was a horrible husband. And she was not the best wife. And so, by the time I was 29, we were divorced. Now, what hurt me the most is I was losing my best friend. Because we were really good at being best friends. But outside of that, I was really trying to figure out again, where was God? Why, what was God doing here? What was, how could this be a plan? Now, through that, something pretty amazing happened. This girl that I had known for a couple of years, we just happened to be on the same night, the night that my wife and I decided to get divorced. I was online, laying around on Facebook, and this girl got online and said, hey, how you doing? Just simple like that. And I said, well, pretty good, except you know, getting divorced. That kind of sucks. Um, but how are you? And we started talking. One thing led to another. And 11 years later, we're married. Well, I mean, we've been married for a while, but we're still married. But those 11 years... They've not been perfect. We've hurt each other. And there have been a lot of things that have hurt me outside of our marriage. And the thing that was most hurting was the multiple miscarriages that we went through. You see, there was one thing that I wanted in life outside of a good wife, and that was a little girl. Or a little boy. But a little girl. And... And I saw people around me having kids, people that couldn't afford them, people that beat them, people that yelled at them, that couldn't give them the life that I thought I could give to a child. But I couldn't have, what kind of God is that? And with every single one, to the best of my recollection, nine miscarriages before our daughter was born. And with every single one, I was chipped away at and broken down further and further. To the point that I knew there was a God. There was no way I could deny it. But I knew he hated me. And he was punishing me for everything that I had done. And he wanted me to kill myself. And so I was going to give him that chance. I didn't know what was going to happen, where I would go. I assumed it would be hell. But I wasn't going to live on this world no more. So I made a plan. I decided what I was going to do. Couldn't muster the strength. Mostly because I thought... You know, if I'm hurting this much, how much is my wife hurting? I saw what she was doing, and I saw that she felt abandoned. And I wasn't going to be like God. I was not going to let her be alone from God and from her husband. So I didn't do it. And I mustered a little bit of energy and a little courage. Got a little bit better. And a little bit better. And pretty soon... We found out that we were pregnant again. We, she was pregnant. I just looked like it. <laughs> but she was pregnant. And something in both of us actually felt different this time. For some reason, we felt like maybe it was good. The doctor's appointments went well. And, and even though Elizabeth was on bed rest, we had hope. And for some reason, we thought this was really going to happen this time. And even when Kennedy was born six and a half weeks early and spent 28 days in the NICU, we had hope. And we, we actually started believing that that hope was in God. So after she was born, we, we were really happy and really close as a family for a little bit. But shortly, that kind of that new of having a baby kind of wore off and we realized that we were missing each other. And to get back to each other, we knew we needed God. And to be with God, we probably should be with the church because we already figured out that that didn't work. But where in Evansville do you go to church? There's a church on every corner and everyone in between. But I had this, I had this supervisor at work, you see. And he told me, without ever telling me, that Jesus was pretty awesome. He showed me what it was like to be a Christian.
without ever saying, this is how you are a Christian. He showed me God. And I thought if there was one place in this whole world, one church that I wanted to go to, it was a church where John Wilcox goes. And I found Catalyst. And turns out there's a lot of John Wilcox types in this place. Sweet, kind, loving, and a little goofy. I don't know if John's still here, but he knows I love him. Um, but, and, and so here we are. We've been here for about three years. We're not perfect. We mess up. But we're getting a little bit better every day. But it's those things that I've been through, those times of, of hurt, those times of anger, those times of just downright crappiness that makes me think I can't be used by God because I'm not worthy. Am I the only one, though? Anybody else feel like they can't be used by God? No. We happen, it happens a lot. Today, what I hope to do is give you guys some encouragement because what I'm going to read to you, what we're going to talk about, really encouraged me, and I think that it can help you guys too. So we're going to, we're going to study uh, 10 verses uh, specifically, and it's in Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 10 is where we're going to be mainly focusing on. So let me get there. So, and I think it's going to be up here somewhere. There. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Okay, good talk. One verse down, I've now preached my... First verse twice. Um, okay, so what are trespasses and sins? That's an easy, easy one to answer. It's going beyond a boundary or breaking the laws or commandments. Going on, you know, bre breaking God's laws by going beyond the boundaries that he sets, right? So what is dead? Well, we know dead, right? But this isn't talking about a physical death. This is talking about a spiritual death. But we can compare the two. So, for those of you who don't know, in my everyday life, I am a paramedic. And as a paramedic, I deal with death a lot. There's two ways, really, that we deal with death on scene. The first way, we get called to a scene, we walk in, we go, yep, he's dead. We call the coroner, and we try to comfort the family the best we can, but there's nothing we can do dead too long but sometimes sometimes we get to be a part of something pretty cool we get we walk into the scene we look at him we go hey he's almost dead let's fix that and sometimes if you're really lucky you actually get to be a part of an actual coming back to life now I have a saying that is it's not my job to save people that's God's job. I just keep him entertained until he makes up his mind. Okay, hold on. There's a gray area here. The theology on that whole God making up his mind, don't, don't worry about that part. That's just a saying. God knows what he's doing. But my point is, I am just the tool for God to use to do what he's doing. So, uh, there was this one time, about seven years ago, my partner and I are called to a scene at a local restaurant, and... It's for a guy who was eating dinner with his wife, and then all of a sudden, he just fell over dead. This guy was like 32, 33 years old. There's no real reason why he should have had that happen to him, but he just fell over dead. Now, through the, through the dispatch process, they start teaching how to do compressions to the bystanders. A few months, or excuse me, that sounded bad, for a few minutes later, the fire department showed up, and they continued the compressions and started uh, breathing for him. And a few minutes after that, my partner and I show up. And we start assessing the scene. We get a report from the fire department, and they tell us, yeah, he's, he, he just went down. This is what's going on. So we're, we're drawing up medications. We're starting IVs. We're, like, you know, getting the paddles on him, you know, boom, boom, right here, right? You guys have seen that stuff, right? Where they... And we get, to see, we get to see what his heart rhythm is. Okay, so 
without going into a big medical lesson, the heart is supposed to have electricity that goes from the top to the bottom, and we go beep, 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 right? Real nice and easy. That's the way it's supposed to work. The way this guy was going on, it's called a thing called ventricular fibrillation, and it was basically the top part doesn't move, but the bottom does, and it's just shaking like a leaf, right? And it's just like a jello mold, blah, 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 like that. <laughs> this is my favorite one. I don't know. I came up with a lot of different ways to describe that, and I like that one. So we went with that one twice today. Um, so, so anyway, so that's what, it, but the, the thing is that with a heartbeat like that, it doesn't really actually create a beat, it, it, and it can't force the blood through the system, so the brain doesn't get oxygen, and the brain just says, all right, I'm out, I'm shutting everything down, so this is the way that guy was, and for all intents and purposes, he's dead, D-E-D -E -D, dead. If this was the Middle Ages, the guy would have been chucked into a ravine somewhere because they can't, they can't do anything about it. So that's how we are with God, right? Before we come to know him, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Picture this scene, right? So there's, there's this guy laying there and his wife screaming, Baby, come back. Breathe. Fire department's doing what they can. Bystanders are scared. We're doing what we can. But see, that's the way we are with God, right? We don't hear the voice of God screaming to us, come back to me. The things of God don't mean anything to us. You know, we don't, we don't hear, you know, we hear a hymn and it's just a song. It's nothing. So we're dead. But what we want to know is, where does that death come from? Well, Romans 5.12 says uh, a little something about that. And it says in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. See that? It began with disobedience, that sin. See, yeah, okay, it was an apple or a fruit or whatever. That's true. But really, the root of the sin was disobedience. You know, God said, don't do this, and they didn't listen. Now, in these verses we're just getting ready to read here, verses 2 and 3, there are three, excuse me, three things discussed that push us into disobedience. So let's read what verse 2 and 3 in Ephesians chapter 2 say. Verse 2, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So see those three things in there. We're going to talk about those. First thing it said was the world. And what is the world? Well, it's very simple. It's just the things that are all around us. It's the systems that are in place. Friends, co-workers, our job, money, whatever. It's the things of the world. It's all around us. And my biggest downfall when it comes to those types of things was that my need for elevation. We talked about how I was in high school when I started learning what popularity was. And I craved that in my career, uh, amongst friends and and, and, and people even that I didn't know. And I wanted more money and more things. And I put all of my effort in trying to get to that. The second thing that it says is Satan. Is who he's talking about, right? Okay. Now, Satan isn't omnipresent like God is. He doesn't follow each and every one of us around individually so that he can mess with us. So he uses his legion of demons and the things of this world to influence, excuse me, influence us. Now, I have had some really great friends, and still do, over the years. But they've not always been the most Christian people. And they've influenced me, and I've given in to that influence, to do some pretty stupid things. Luckily, haven't been hurt too awful bad or gotten in any trouble. So that's good. But think about that for you. What, what things are you influenced to do to keep you from God? The 
third thing that it talks about is the flesh. Now, we're not talking about our skin and our bones or this flabby stuff here in the middle that some of us got. What it's talking about is our fallen nature. Our fallen nature, you know, drives us to do certain things that keep us from God. My flesh, I, I suffer with, uh, with lust and pride and jealousy and anger. That all sounds kind of crummy, right? What I've talked about so far, kind of bad news, right? We're all kind of, basically just says we're all stinkers. But there's two words getting ready to come up in this next verse. Two of my favorite words in the whole human language. And that is, but God. Whenever you see a but God, you're getting ready to see something pretty awesome. Because... When God gets involved, things change for the better. And so, let's see what verse 4 and 5 have to say here in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. See, one of God's intrinsic attributes, who he is as God, is love, right? God is love. And how he he relates that love to mankind is through mercy and grace. Now, I've heard those two words kind of interchanged a lot, so I'm going to break them down real quick just to give some more definition. Grace is something given that is not deserved. Any of you guys with kids, you might understand this one. Picture your kids and they're, let's be honest, they're kind of turds sometimes, right? They're kicking each other. They're throwing things at the cat. They're flushing bologna sandwiches down the road, or down the the road, bless you, down the uh, toilet. And they're just heathens sometimes. But come Christmas morning, They come sliding down the banister or come running down the hallway to a big old Christmas tree with gifts underneath it. Why? Because they put sugar in your gas tank? No. Because you love them. Because you love them. And how we relate our love to our kids and to other people is by giving them things. The opposite side, mercy, is not giving something that is deserved. Like... So you got a 17-year-old son now, right? And he doesn't have a car because he doesn't have a job. So he uses your car on the weekends to go hang out with his friends. Now, several weeks into, several weeks go by and everything's going well, but one day he comes home and the gas tank isn't filled. And you look at him and you say, Son, I told you to fill up the gas tank. I even gave you $20 to do so. And you didn't do it. He's like, Yeah, I know, I... I, I went to G.D. Ritzy's and got some ice cream. Sorry. And, and you say, all right, look, you do this again, you're going to be in trouble. We're going to take away the car for six weeks. You can't drive it. So things go well for a few weeks. But all of a sudden, one Sunday morning, you get up, you run a little bit late. The curlers aren't working, so your wife's having a hard time getting ready to go. The kids are screaming. You're rushing everybody to the car. You get in the car and everybody's buckled in. You turn on the car and bing, ding, 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 ding. (laughs) Boy, (laughs) I told you to fill up the car, right? He says, I know, Dad. You say, son, I made a way. This is going to be fine. There's a five-gallon can of gas sitting in the garage. I want you to go get that. Fill up the tank. You can still make it to church on time. See, God knew we were going to mess up. He knew that we were going to, you know, do all kinds of stupid things. So he made a way for us to still get where he wants us to go. And that way, of course, is Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. So, let's look next. Um... Since, since God knew, now what? Well, let's look at uh, 1 John 
chapter 4, verse 9. And that says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. So see, just as death came through Adam's sin, now life has come through the death of Jesus. But when did God do that? Well, uh, if we you know, go back to here to verse 5, it says uh, in, in Ephesians 2, uh, it, says, uh, it says, while you were still dead in your trespasses, while you were still dead in your trespasses is when Jesus came. When you were still doing the rotten things and you, he, he knew what you were going to do, he still died for your sin. And that's an amazing thing. That's just absolutely awesome for me to think of because, I mean, how many of us would die on a cross for someone who was blatantly going to disobey us, blatantly not care about what we were doing right then and there? So let's go back to my patient, right? He was dead. D-E-D -E -D dead. Real dead. But we had the possible, we had the power to possibly bring him back. Like I said, that's pretty awesome. So, so we've got these pads on him. We see what's going on. We've got the IVs in. We've given him some medicine. We know what he needs, and that is to shock him. Now, you guys probably have seen this on a medical show somewhere, but they got the, they've got the, the, the jump box, as I call it, and we power it up, and it screams real loud, and everybody says, clear, and ka right? You shock him. Now, if you've ever seen these medical shows, when that happens, they're usually they wake up, and they go, oh, what happened? Where am I? It never happens that way, right? It never in real life ever, okay, almost never happens like that in real life. This time it kind of did. This time, when we shocked him, he immediately set bolt upright and said, Oh, that tickled! <laughs> yeah. That's actually not the words he used, but for the sake of being inside of a church, and I try not to say those words as much as possible, I'm going to censor it a little bit. He was alive, right? He was alive. And he was shocked, literally shocked about that. <laughs> and, yeah, Ben liked that one. So, so he was alive. That's the whole point, right? He was alive. And just a couple of seconds ago, he was dead. Now, when he was dead, he had no idea that he was dead. He, like I said, he couldn't hear his friends or his family. He didn't know what was going on around him. He was dead. But now he's alive and he's excited and he's happy and everything's good. He's scared, not sure what's going on, but he's alive. And that's, that's just like we are in Christ. You know, when, when we're dead in Christ or when we're dead in our, in our sins, we don't know. We're just living life like everything's going to be fine. But then when we come alive in Christ, well, then we know and we're happy. So now what? Okay, let's, let's continue in Ephesians 2, uh, verses 6 and 7. So we were saved by grace and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the thing is we weren't meant to lay in the hospital bed. Right. When, we, when we are brought back to life, when Jesus calls us out of that grave, we're meant to get out there. Go tell people about what we've experienced. And not only that, but we now have a future in heaven. We now have an eternity with God to praise Him and love Him in heaven. So what do we do with that? Well, verse 8 says, By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. 
It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. We've got to remember that awesome grace that God has showered upon us. And we, we've got to remember, too, that there's nothing we can do. We can't out-sin God's grace. No matter what we do. If we, if we start thinking that, we can, that there was anything that we did to get that love and that grace, then we start thinking there's something we can do to not have his love. And that's not the case. Because he's always going to love us. So, with that in mind, let's see what to do with it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 has a little bit to say about that. And what I, what I like about this verse, it's very interesting, um, specifically after last week. If you were here or watched last week's sermon with Greg, um, you may remember this, that he actually used this same, uh, I think he went 17 through 21 actually, but... To me, when I was sitting there watching this, I was like, oh man, God must have something in here for us, this, these verses. Because Greg and I didn't, we didn't talk about it. We didn't say what verses we were going to use. So let's, let's see what God has to say here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. And verse 20 says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. God's ambassadors. Now, what is an ambassador, right? Think about an ambassador from the U.S. to Germany or whatever. And they go to Germany and they say, hey, the U.S. is cool. We've got pizza and tacos and all kinds of cool stuff. Let's be friends. Well, that's kind of what we are with God, right? For God. We, we go to people and we say, hey, Jesus has love. Jesus has mercy and grace. And, and Jesus is real cool. So why don't you come to church? So, we are his authorized representative. And he has entrusted such a great mission to all of us, those, those of us who are sinners, right? So, let's finish this up here. Put a bow on this set here and read verse 10 uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, excuse me. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says... For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, that word workmanship here in verse 10, in the Greek, the word is poema. And that is where we get the word poem in our English language. So, think about that. A poem can describe so much love, so much emotion, right? Love or anger or jealousy or rage in just a few short sentences. It's perfectly cra crafted by, by the poet. And that's exactly how God does for us. He crafts us and molds us into what he wants for us. And he has laid out his plan before us. It's not that we have to know where we're going. We don't have to we don't have to know it so that we can walk. We just have to trust him he, and, and know that he has given us a plan. And we take one step and one step, and pretty soon we're right where we're supposed to be as long as we trust God and do what he says. Now that patient. I didn't really know at the time what happened to him. He could have been on drugs. He could have worked too hard, maybe he didn't eat right, um, but it didn't matter, you know, it didn't matter what he had done to be in that position, we were there to save his life, and it doesn't matter what we've done, in the same way, God is there to save us from hell, 
And I don't know what's happened to that guy since that day. I haven't seen him. I did find out that he had a, like a congenital heart defect that went undiagnosed. But um, I, don't, I don't know. But I do know that he showed amazing gratitude that day. You know, when we were, when we were loading him into the ambulance, when we were dropping him off at the hospital, he was thanking us over and over and over again. He was very, very, very gracious. Uh, a lot of gratitude. And then, and, and, and then I'd like to think that he went on to live a better life. Maybe he was a better husband, a better father. I'd like to think that he uh, maybe found Christ through all this, or if he was already a Christian, became closer to God. One thing I'm pretty sure of is that if ever he gets the opportunity to tell that story, <laughs> he's going to tell it. Because he was dead, no life, and then alive again. And I would literally tell everyone I could that I had died and come back to life. Because that's a cool story. And you could really kind of spice it up a little bit with, I don't know, something. But it'd be really cool. It'd be really cool to tell people. And that's how we should be with God, right? Be gracious. Thank God for all of it. Thank, be thankful for what he did. Be a better Christian. Be a better person in general. And then go tell everybody you see what he's done. Now, that's the main course of what we had today, okay? But I don't know about you guys, but I like dessert, okay? So I want to give you all a little bit of dessert. Because dessert is delicious. And what that dessert is, basically this today, is that it sounds really good when I say it, right? And you know, you're like, okay, that's good, Micah. That's really good, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know. See, I've done some really bad stuff. You think you were bad, I'm bad. Well, let me tell you about some people who also were bad and had some pretty good excuses if they wanted to use them. So i got two lists that I'm going to go through with you. The first list is a list of excuses. All week we've been talking about excuses. Let go of your excuses. Let go of your excuses. Well, these are the excuses that we're talking about. Now, as I read these, I want you to think about them. And if one sticks out to you, one that you identify with, think about it. Because we're going to talk about some people here in a few minutes that also would have had those excuses, but continued to go ahead and serve God anyway. So... Maybe your excuse is, well, you're not trained. Maybe you don't know how to do what God is calling you to do. Maybe you've got some people in your family that are more righteous than you, and you're afraid that, you know, you don't know what to do like they do. Maybe they'll make fun of you or something. Maybe you're poor and you have no, like, real earthly position that, you know, you're afraid that nobody's going to listen to you. Maybe you've got a history of being angry or unkind or greedy. Maybe you've been dishonest. Maybe you're from a small town and you just think that you won't be able to get the exposure that you need or that God needs to actually do anything. Maybe, uh, maybe you've doubted God a whole lot. You've doubted the things of God. Maybe you come from a place where women aren't allowed to do anything for God. Maybe you've come from that type of church that just doesn't allow for that. Or maybe you have family that's told you that it's a man's world. Women can't do anything. Maybe you've had a lot of sexual sin in your life, or just some sexual sin. Maybe you're real young. Maybe you think you don't have enough experience, whether in your actual age or your time as a Christian. Maybe you've cursed God. Or just in general, you've sinned. Nothing necessarily specific. You just know you're a sinner. Well, the last one I've got here is that you're actually a generally good Christian. And maybe you grew up from a very early age with good parents and you've always done the right thing and, and, and you became a Christian early in life and now you think you don't, you can't relate to the people who have done things so God can't use you. Well, let's, let's look at that. I'm going to list some people here and the first 12 we're going to talk about are apostles. And we, they've obviously done some really great things, right? So we know that. And then we're going to talk about some others as well. But first of all, Simon Peter. 
I mean, Peter wasn't trained. He didn't know Mosaic law. But Jesus chose him to walk right beside him, not only to be one of his disciples, not only one of his apostles, but one of his three closest men. Andrew was Simon's little brother in the shadow of the great Simon Peter. James of Alphaeus and Jude uh, were possibly Jesus' brothers. Um, Simon and Andrew, James and John were fishermen. They had no real prominence in this world. James and John, brothers, Jesus called them the sons of thunder. And scholars have said that maybe that means that they were a little too angry or maybe they were too bold beyond their, you know, beyond the necessity. Uh, Philip, Bartholomew, Simon the Zealot, we don't really know a lot about them, like what they did. They didn't really have any significant roles, but we do know that after the death of Jesus, they went on and preached the gospel. Simon, Andrew, Philip, and others from small towns Matthew was a tax collector. Judas Iscariot was a a thief and made treasurer amongst the disciples. And of course we know that he went on to betray Jesus. I got to thinking about this one, is that Jesus knows all. Jesus is God. He knew that Judas was going to betray him and yet still welcomed him as one of his closest people and walked beside him. Both Matthew and Judas were known to be dishonest, unkind, and greedy. Thomas and others were known as doubters. You know, we get that famous saying here in America, you know, doubting Thomas. So, I mean, he obviously had some doubts. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was, she was poor, and the others were very poor. Mary also was very young, and yet she was chosen by God to bear Jesus Christ. Teenagers, we're going to talk about this on Wednesday, uh, so be here. I'm looking at you guys. <laughs> All right. Um, also, Mary Magdalene. Okay, Mary Magdalene was possibly a prostitute, and she was healed of demon possession. Both Mary Magdalene and Jesus' mother Mary, and other women. If we look at Luke chapter eight, it says that many women were involved in the ministry of Jesus. Paul, one of the greatest Christians of all time, known far and wide for how awesome of a Christian he was, before that, killed and imprisoned Christians. A buddy of mine sent me something last night, or yesterday sometime, about Paul, and it was really cool, and I want to share it with you. It basically said that Paul, when he died, was welcomed into heaven by the martyrs that he killed. And I was just, how awesome of love is that, that that even Paul, one, had a place to be used by God, and two, was welcomed by people he murdered. Like, oh, so awesome. Um, so, wh- where do you, you know, I see myself in these lists a lot. I mean, if, if the last 40 minutes have taught us anything, I am not well trained. Uh, I don't come from a great background. I don't come from a great family, you know, of high priority. Uh, I've been involved in sexual sin. I've doubted. I've cursed God and even hated him. Do you guys see yourselves in those lists? You got something on your mind? You got something that, that keeps you held back from being used by God? Well, what if I forgot about all that stuff? What if I just said, you know what, God doesn't remember it, why should I? And just walked where he led me. What if we all did? What if we just let it go? What amazing things would God do in our lives, in in our personal lives, in this church, and the church around the world, what kind of awesome things would God do if we would just give up and trusted him and walked where he led? I think it'd be pretty amazing. So the band's going to come up here in a little bit, in a couple couple minutes. And usually when they play their last song, we stand and we sing and we think about why the preacher rambled on for too long. We think about 
what we're going to go eat for lunch or what we have to do to get ready for tomorrow. But today, I think maybe we just need to take some time to kind of relax and reflect on ourselves. Let God tell us where we need to go and how to get rid of the excuses that we have. Because I think we're in three, one of three different categories, all of us are. Maybe you're still dead. Maybe you're not saved. You've, you've never really heard the voice of the Lord before. But you see, God, the creator of all, created us to be in perfect harmony with him. But our sin separate us from him. And sins, they, they can't be removed by anything that we do. But Jesus paid the price for our sin. He lived as our example, died on our behalf, and rose again as our guarantee. A guarantee that anyone who trusts in him is forgiven, destined for heaven, and assured of eternal life with him. And that life, well, it starts the moment that you accept him. You don't have to work toward it. You don't have to get better so that you have that kind of life. It just starts immediately. Now, maybe you're in the second category. Where you're saved... You're alive, but you're in a spiritual coma. So you're, you're alive, but you're not really living for Christ. You're not doing the things that he wants you to do. Yeah, you're, you're okay, you're trying, but you're not really out there. And you need the courage to let go of your excuses and live the way that God has commanded. Number three, you're saved doing great. You're doing a lot of the things that God really wants you to do, but you're kind of sitting on the back porch. You've gone through the ambulance ride to the ER. You've gone through that. You've gone through the, uh, the ICU. You've, uh, you've gone through rehab in your home, but you're just kind of sitting there telling the kids stories about what you used to do. And what you need to do is get up out your, your rocking chair and get out there on the streets and tell people about Jesus. Go out and tell people about him. So as the band comes up, let's just remember, let's just reflect. Think about where God has led you from, where you are now. Dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace that you can use even me that you can use even us. Because no matter how much we deserve death, you love us enough to give us another shot. God, I thank you that you have allowed us to be here and hear your word. And I pray that you would just let it soak into us. Let us think about you. Let us know what you want for us and where the next step is. We don't need the whole plan. We just need the next step. And God, we need to know that it doesn't take some fancy prayer. No matter which of the three categories we're in, we don't have to say some fancy prayer, God. We just have to say, God, forgive me and help me to do what you want me to do because I believe that Jesus died for me and rose again. Give us, give us what you want for us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.